past week, our daughter in Spokane called and <clears throat> was telling my wife a little story about their daughter, Savannah, who is not quite four yet. She's going to be four next month. She woke up in the middle of the night, about four o'clock in the morning, yelling for mom, mom, mom. Of course, that's you with young children. Understand how that works. And so my wife went running in to see what emergency Savannah had. And my daughter went running in to see what emergency Savannah had. And Savannah said, I want a sparkly pillow. Now, where that came from, we have no idea. Her mother had no idea. Uh, I want a sparkly pillow like Michaela had. That's her older sister, and she doesn't have a sparkly pillow. So again, we had no idea where that came from, and so that went on for a little bit. And then she just said, hold my hand. So Heidi held her hand for a few minutes. And she went back to sleep. Then everybody else was able to go back to sleep because she was determined she was going to wake everybody up. And I thought to myself after hearing about that, how many thousands of years have parents been going through that, getting awakened in the middle of the night with their small children who uh, for one reason or another became unsettled, you know, a dream, a nightmare, just something went on and unsettled them. How many thousands of years has that been going on? Because human nature really hasn't changed in all the thousands of years that man has been on the earth. I found a couple of quotes that I found interesting, one by George Orwell, who said, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good and not quite all the time. That certainly seems to fit most human beings. Albert Einstein said this, he said, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. What was his point of view? And then finally, Edgar Allan Poe, at this point, this comment about human nature, he said, I have no faith in human perfectibility. I think that human exertion will have no appreciable effect upon humanity. Man is now only more active, not more happy, nor more wise than he was 6,000 years ago. And it sure seems to be the case as we look at the world around us. So how much has human nature changed in 6,000 years? And it really hasn't, or there are whole sections of Scripture that really wouldn't be valid, that we couldn't count on or learn from. The Old Testament is an interesting chronicle of human failures and human successes. It's interesting how the Scripture deals with its leading characters very candidly. You think back about you know, the flaws of David or Abraham or Moses. Uh, God deals with those leaders as far as recording their lives in a very candid way. And in many cases, the accounts are neatly packaged in kind of a case history form. Why would that be? Well, I think a couple of places give us an answer. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians 10, we'll read verses 11 through 13. Pertaining to those case histories of individuals and human nature, the history of the past, verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition. God had them written up in case history form in so many places for us for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Then he says, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape. We're going to see some examples that God did just that. Made a way of escape possible that you may be able to bear it. So these were written, these case histories, for our admonition that we could learn from. And then 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. 
and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture. All of the Old Testament. All of it has been given for us to learn from. <clears throat> so God caused many examples to be recorded for us. And when you think about it, Jesus Christ as God of the Old Testament was there on the scene. He knew the strengths. He knew the weaknesses of all those that he used and why they made the mistakes they did. He knew all of that. He saw all of that happening. He also knew that in the future, many would be called as pioneers, as first fruits, to be trained, to be serving with him when he begins to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, and that we would need those examples to help us and to teach us. So we have the same, human nature hasn't changed. We have the same weaknesses as men and women in the Old Testament. The same weaknesses and strengths. In many case histories, uh, God kind of stripped human nature bare and laid it out in front of us so we could see and learn from those examples. That statement back in 1 Corinthians 10, I want to read this from the Phillips translation, verse 11 and 12. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12, the Phillips New English says, Now <clears throat> these things which happened to our ancestors are illustrations of the way in which God works. And they were written down to be a warning to us who are the heirs of the ages which have gone before us. Verse 12, so let the man who feels sure of his standing today be careful that he does not fall tomorrow. You may be sure today, but be careful about the future. So what I want to do today is look at the work of several human kings all kings of Judah, mentioned in the Old Testament, because in the beginning, all of them had several things in common. They all had a lot going for them. We would say, boy, they had a great deal going for them at the beginning of their reign. Uh, all could have been considered a pillar in the local congregation of the Church of God uh, with all that they had going for them. All had a very zealous first love. They all had that. But in each case, in each case, they became spiritually weak. And then they began to make some serious mistakes. Although, in each case, God also gave them a way of escape. We'll see how that worked out. They eventually threw away the, their faith. And you could say they were spiritual shipwrecks by the end of their lives. And each of them died in disgrace, despite the way they started out. And how do they get from here to here? In each case is an interesting story and a case history for us to study. So God gave these to us, I think, to stir us up spiritually, to remind us, to teach us, to learn lessons so we can be successful in maintaining a certain level of zeal and faithfulness to God and desire to serve Him. So let's go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 14 for the first example. See what we can learn here. See if you can pick out. In each case, I've come up with a label. It's my label for each of these kings. You may come up with a little different label once you look at the history. But uh, I have come up with a label for each of them that helps me to remember. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 1. So Abijah rested with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land was quiet for ten years. He was making good decisions. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the altars of the foreign gods on the high places and broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandments. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from the cities of Judah and the kingdom was quiet under him. What a wonderful statement. This is a man by his leadership, by his example, by his serving God. The kingdom was quiet. 
and he built fortified cities in Judah for the land had rest. He had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Now, what's the, what could possibly be a warning in this for us? Here's Asa's life. Judah becoming spiritually clean. It says he was loyal to God. He handled problems well. There was peace in the land. Let's read beginning in verse 8. Verse 8 through 14. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah who carried shields and spears and from Benjamin 280,000 men who carried shields and drew uh, bows. All these were mighty men of valor. Then Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots and he came to Marashah. So Asa went out against him, set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zephathah at Marashah and Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. And then I'll notice this statement, O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown. They could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army. And they carried away very much spoil, and they defeated all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them. And they plundered all the cities, for there was exceedingly much spoil in them. I think Asa's attitude here is noteworthy, especially there in verse 11, the way he cried out to God. You are our our God. Do not let man prevail against you. And there was a fear of God that uh, that struck the Ethiopian army, and they won this. And uh, Judah won this great victory. Again, what's wrong? Was anything wrong in all of this? We read on in chapter fifteen, beginning in verse one. Now the spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, and went out to meet Asa and said to him, "Hear me, Asa." And all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no uh, peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, but great turmoil in all the inhabitants of the land. So nation was destroyed by nation, city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you be strong. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. He did even more. It says he removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim, restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. So was faithful. He was continuing to serve God. Now let's read in verse 16. Also, he removed Maacah, the mother of Asa the king. Who is that? His own mother. He removed his own mother from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. Asa cut down her obscene image and crushed and burned it by the brook Kidron. So, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. He also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated, and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and utensils. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. What happened then? Asa was clearly faithful for 35 years. 35 years serving God in this way. 35 years of peace and this and the nation doing well. But then he made a major mistake. But it seems it's the kind of mistake that the problem may have been building up for years, and in the face of a trial, it showed itself. Chapter 16, verse 1. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. So here is Judah at war with Israel. People tell you. I have a hard time understanding how Judah could be at war with Israel 
But in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah, built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and came to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. What was the problem here? What did Asa do instead of going to God? Instead of asking God for help, it appears that he was caught off guard, perhaps had drifted away from God a bit. We're not sure exactly, but instead of relying on God as he had in the past, instead he put his trust in Syria. And he never really turned back from, from that. Uh, verse 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer, a prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Here was an opportunity. The prophet came to him. Here is the way of escape from this mistake for Asa. A prophet has come to warn him. And you might think, well, that would change his heart, turn his mind in a different direction. The prophet continues in verse 8, were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army? with very many chariots and horsemen, yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Asa's heart was not right before God. But here was his chance to escape this mistake. God gave him a way of escape, as we read in 1 Corinthians. And what was his response? Verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer, put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Up until that time, there was quiet and peace. Now it changed. Note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. You might think, well, that would turn his heart. Yet, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in his 41st year of his reign. They buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David. They laid him in the bed with, filled with spices and various ingredients, prepared in a mixture of ointments. They made a very great burning for him. It ends on that sad note. 35 years serving faithfully. And then he goes in this direction. And then God warns him. And you think, again, he would turn from his direction, but he didn't. Then God gave him two more years. <clears throat> and still, he didn't change. What was the problem? It seems Asa's basic problem was that he had become spiritually lax, that he had drifted away from God, and in the face of trials, the attack, you know, the illness that came on, since he hadn't been close to God, that he didn't exercise faith at a critical time where he could have turned to God in the face of the army of Israel, he turned to the king of Syria instead of turning to God in faith. So my label for Asa was this, the faithless king. The faithless king. You may find a different label, but that works for me. Asa, the faithless king. What about us? When we first came into the church of God, some did give up. Mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, job, to exercise faith to obey God. And God has blessed them uh, as a result. But the question that I had to ask myself is, a question we can all ask ourselves. I've been in the church for many years. Many of you have. Do I have more faith now than I did when I first came in the church? Is my zeal for God's way of life more now than when I first came into the church? I, I hope so, and I pray about that. What about, you know, the spiritual basics, the tools of 
Bible study and fasting and prayer, those things. Asa's pattern was that he started out very strong, but he seemed to drift away and became faithless at a time when he needed faith to trust in God. So I think that's the lesson here, that if, if contact with God, if our contact with God becomes threadbare, that thread can snap, especially when a, a trial strikes. It, it can sap our zeal for God and undermine our faith and our relationship with God. It happened to Asa, and the example in the Bible shows us that it can happen to us. That's why it's a warning, a reminder, and we have this case history of Asa, the faithless king. Let's go to a second one in 2 Chronicles 24. What's the story here? Totally different story, but as far as the events, but beginning and ending are are similar, 2 Chronicles 24, first one, Joash, it says, was seven years old when he became king, seven years old, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibla, Beersheba, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Why that qualifier? Why doesn't it say he did what was right all the days of his life? All the days of Jehoiada the priest. Verse 4. Now what happened after this that Josiah, Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. So his heart was right. This is what he was going to do. Verse 13. So the workmen labored and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. When they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, the priest. They made from it articles for the house of the Lord, articles for serving and offering spoons, vessels of gold and silver, and they offered burnt offering to the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada grew old, and he was full of days, and he died. 130 years old when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, to Joash, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, served wooden images and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Interesting story as far as what happens. Uh, We read in verse 19 and 20, yet he, God, sent prophets. Here again is that way of escape. God always makes a way of escape. Here's an opportunity for Joash. He sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. The Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest who stood above the people and said to them, thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. There again is that way of escape. Joash did fine. As long as there was someone to kind of prod him, but he began to drift away when Jehoiada died. When he was on his own, he kind of drifted in a different direction and went into some things that were just not right. He did fine for a period of time, but then later on, let's read in verse 21. Zechariah came to remind them to prophesy, so they conspired against him. Could have gone the other way. They could have said, okay, Zechariah, you're right. We've been foolish. We'll change. But they conspired against him. At the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, he said, The Lord look on it and repay. So it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him. They came up to Judah and Jerusalem, destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people, sent all the spoil to the king of Damascus. It goes on to describe this destruction. Verse 25, When they withdrawn from him from Uh, The king, uh, for they left him severely wounded. His own servants conspired against him because of the blood of of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and killed him on his bed. So he died. And they buried him in the city of David 
but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. He died in disgrace. Again, here was an individual that had served God, drifted away, and finally failed. What was the basic problem here? What's the lesson for us? What label could we come up with? It appears that Joash had to be continually prodded. But as long as Jehoiada the priest was there to prod him, to push him, that he was good. But on his own, he drifted away. I just labeled him the drifter king. Joash the drifter king. It seemed he lacked personal commitment. Personal commitment for the long haul of his life. He was committed as long as someone prodded him, as long as someone pushed him. But as far as a personal commitment for the long haul of his life, he didn't have that. There are some amazing stories of what people have accomplished by being committed to overcome things in life and stay committed for the long haul. I'll share a few of those stories with you. A man by the name of Johnny Fulton was run over by a car at the age of three, suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, a fractured skull, compound fractures of his legs. Didn't even look like he would live. But he wouldn't give up. In fact, he later ran the half mile in less than two minutes. One of the first to do it. Ran the half mile in less than two minutes. Walt Davis, totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old. He became the Olympic high jump champion in 1952. A girl named Shelley Mann, paralyzed by polio when she was five years old. She wouldn't give up. She eventually claimed eight different swimming records for the U.S., won a gold medal at the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, Australia. These are people who are committed to a certain course and wouldn't give up. One of my favorites, it happened in 1938, a gentleman by the name of Karoli Takax, a member of Hungary's World Championship pistol shooting team, and sergeant in the army, lost his right hand when a grenade he was holding exploded. But he didn't give up. He learned to shoot left-handed and won gold medals in the 1948 and 1952 Olympics. He was a right-hander, lost his right hand, learned how to shoot left-handed. These names you've heard of, Lou Gehrig, was such a clumsy ball player that the boys in his neighborhood wouldn't let him play on their team, wouldn't choose him. He, wasn't not, he was not only not chosen last, he was not chosen at all. He was so bad, but, you know, eventually he's... He entered the Baseball Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson couldn't read until he was 10 years old. But he was a committed person. He committed to teaching himself. <coughs> As you know, he became our 28th president. Just examples of what human beings have done with commitment. And in the case of, of Joash, it seemed he lost that if, unless he was prodded. And so it makes me ask myself, and we can all ask ourselves, is our prod to obey God from within? From within ourselves. Not because someone else prods us. Not because a husband, wife, child, you know, or anybody else, friend, prods us, parents. But is our prod to obey God because we are convicted in our heart and mind. And that's where our conviction comes from. It's important that we obey God because we've proven that that's what we should do. And that's what we are. It's part of us that we have that conviction. It has to do with commitment and personal conviction. And Joash, unless he was prodded, failed to have that. Let's go to another example in 2 Chronicles 25. 2 Chronicles 25. Let's see another example. A man by the name of Amaziah. Verse 1, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king and, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoiadan of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Some translations say not with a perfect heart. What was his weakness? Verse 5, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and set them over captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, according to their fathers' houses throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them to be 300,000 choice men able to go to war who could handle spear and shield. He also hired 
100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But God didn't like that idea. So a man of God came to him and said, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you. For the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim. But if you go, be gone, be strong in battle, even so God shall make you fall before the enemy, for God has power to help and to overthrow. <clears throat> so in this case, Amaziah listened. He took heed. Then Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do about the hundred talents, the money which I have given to the troops of Israel already? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. So Amaziah discharged the troops that had come to him from Ephraim to go back home. Therefore their anger was greatly aroused against Judah, and they returned home in great anger, because not only would they get money to be paid, but spoils of victory they'd have as well. They were going to miss out on that. Amaziah strengthened himself, leading his people. He went to the Valley of Salt, killed 10,000 of the people of Seir with God's help. Uh, also the children of Judah took captive 10,000 alive, brought them to the top of the rock, kind of gruesome, cast them down from the top of the rock so that they were all dashed in pieces. Verse 13 <coughs> talks a little bit about the revenge the Israelite troops got in attacking the city of Judah, cities of Judah, and taking spoil. But Amaziah had hired these Israelite soldiers, let them go, and followed God's instructions. God gave him a great victory. Said, you will win, and he did. And what was the next thing Amaziah did? Verse 14. <clears throat> now it was so after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, the ones he had just defeated, brought their gods, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. <clears throat> Could you make a more ridiculous decision? God had just given you victory over this people. He had just destroyed those who had relied on these gods. And now he takes these gods and brings them home to be his gods. They couldn't protect the people that he had just defeated. And why did he take them home? It just doesn't seem to make sense. Verse 15. Therefore the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah. And he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their own people from your hand? <coughs> So it was, as, <coughs> as he talked with him, that the king said to him, have we made you the king's counselor? Again, notice the opportunity, verse 15, the way of escape. Here is Amaziah's out. You're right, bad mistake. I shouldn't have done this. Send them, get rid of them, we'll destroy them. <coughs> he didn't do that. So it was, as he talked with him, that the king said to him, have we made you the king's counselor? Cease, quiet. Why should you be killed? Then the prophet ceased and said, I know that God is determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. Why have you sought the gods of the people? There was a way out. Amaziah didn't take it. What was his problem? How would you label him? Why was he so curious about these gods of Seir, of the people of Seir? Why, why was that so important to him? <clears throat> Basic problems seem to be that Amaziah was kind of a dabbler, dabbling perhaps in other religions with other gods, <clears throat> dabbling in ideas contrary to God's way, caused him to lose his focus, to be single-minded in focus on God's truth and the things he knew and he understood. I just label him Amaziah the Dabbler King. Amaziah the Dabbler King. And it reminded me of a verse back in 2 John verse 10. If you've been watching the uh, General Epistles classes with David Johnson, he had some interesting comments about this verse. <coughs> Second John chapter 10, or verse 10. Where it says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. We have people come to our door occasionally, and you probably do as well. When we lived in Georgia, we were out in the country. We had five acres out in the country, and our house was at the end of about a quarter to a third mile gravel driveway. 
<clears throat> it looked like it just went back into the woods, but we were up on top of a hill there. So people didn't find us very often there. Well, I came home from visiting one day and uh, had just reached in the mailbox, pulled out a new booklet. I, I've told you this story before. And that new booklet at that time was The Real Jesus. And as I drove up to the house, there was a car there with four people in it. And they had, were just getting back into the car, but when they saw me come, they got back out. And they came up and introduced themselves and wanted to know if I really knew Jesus. And I said, you know, I, I believe I do. And I have something that I'd like to give to you because I think you'd like to know more about the real Jesus. And I handed them this book of the real Jesus. And they said, oh, we're sorry, we can't, uh, can't take your literature. And I said, well, uh, you know, I'm not interested in yours either. And they went their way and uh, never came back. But we have those occasions Occasionally, and you know, here is a scripture about not receiving him into your house nor greet him. <clears throat> there are other ways of doing this, as Mr. Johnson pointed out, than just letting someone into your house, sitting down, and have a conversation with them. And I think today there are a flood of ideas that exist to dabble in, a flood of ideas, especially in this age of the internet and instant information at our fingertips. Many different religious ideas, publications, videos, preachers, church organizations, church of God groups, all kinds of things to dabble in, and many different opinions about various doctrines, different opinions about this church, that church, about Church of God AWA and how we do things and why we, do, you know, opinions about that, pro and con, and all kinds of things to dabble in. They're all out there. And we can all invite them into our house or not. I think the danger can be is that it can begin to shake our faith and, and increase doubt. It can. It's possible. I wonder if maybe, you know, here in this case, Amaziah dabbling in something that, you know, eventually took his feet out from under him. There is a spiritual danger about getting too close to the edge of. Ideas that take us away from the trunk of the tree. Uh, I was reading an account of a gentleman who visited Victoria Falls in Africa, and this is what he said. He said, Africa's Victoria Falls produces a cloud of mist that is often heavy enough to impair visibility. While I was walking the path that skirts the gorge into which the Zambezi River tumbles, I noticed a sign on the rim, but I couldn't make it out. Not wanting to miss whatever it might be noting, I slithered and slid through the mud out to the very brink only to read the message, Danger, Crumbling Edge. In other words, the guy made the mistake of getting too close to the edge and thankfully didn't fall over. But I, I think there's a point there as far as not getting too close to the edge of ideas that can take us away from God's truth. Uh, Matthew 6 talks about our eye being single focused and held steady on God's truth, on God's way of life. And I think Amaziah's problem was he began to dabble in other things and it took him away from the truth. Second Chronicles 26. Let's get another example here. Second Chronicles 26. <clears throat> and beginning in verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah, and the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, <coughs> who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. He talks about in verse 7 and 8, the various peoples that he destroyed or defeated in battle with God's help and continue to serve God. And I think verse 15 is really an interesting verse. It would be nice to know what some of these things were that he invented. Verse 15 and he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows, large stones, some kind of catapult perhaps. So his fame spread far and wide 
for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Well, two things there. Marvelously helped by whom? Well, the idea is by God. God marvelously helped him, strengthened him, gave him wisdom as long as he served him until he became strong. Then what? At the peak of his career, when he was strong, he fell. What did he do? Verse 16. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What was that all about? The uh, Hill and Delitz commentary says when Uzziah had become mighty, <coughs> his heart was lifted up in pride unto destructive deeds. And then it says this, with a lofty feeling of his power, Uzziah wanted to make himself high priest of his kingdom. Like the kings of Egypt. In Egypt, the kings were also priests. They were gods. They were priests. They were kings. They were all of that. Apparently, Uzziah wanted to make himself a priest like the kings of Egypt and other nations whose kings were also high priests. What he had in mind. Verse 17. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You have no honor from the Lord God. Here was his opportunity. Here was the way of escape. God was giving him an opportunity to say, okay, you're right. I really, this is wrong. I need to get out of here. This is none of my business. He had the opportunity. Then Uzziah became furious. Verse 19. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Another warning from God. Before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him. There on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah from first to last. Prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote, So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings, where they said he is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. What was Uzziah's problem here? He wanted, clearly wanted to do things his way, but what would be the thinking that would make you think, well, I'll go into the temple. I can do what the priests do. And again, what's human nature like? Um, he knew the priests. He knew their problems, their personal human weaknesses. They're not so great. His attitude was kind of, who are they to tell me what to do? And he allowed his respect to wane for those God had appointed to do this certain job. And in our human weaknesses, we can get this way too, especially if we weaken our contact with God. But Uzziah became, and I labeled him the presumptuous king. Uzziah the presumptuous king. He began to presume and take some things to himself that you know, he, he really had no business doing. And again, it made me think back in my life when I first came to the church and when you first came to the church, we can all look back at that and remember perhaps when we had just been baptized and how small we felt in God's eyes. We just wanted to learn. We just wanted to be taught. We were willing to serve in any way, kind of awestruck that God had even called us. Uzziah lost that attitude it kind of became, you know, I've been around, now. I'm a king for a long time. I know the ropes. I know these men. I know their weaknesses. Look at the other kings of other nations. They do all this. I need to be more as they are. And he lost some of his respect. He lost that humble spirit. He became presumptuous. And he was punished for that. 
I think there's a powerful lesson and a reminder that we continue to ask God to help us to grow in true humility and understand what that is. What about 2 Chronicles 34? You remember this, King? 2 Chronicles 34, those of you who have children may have the old arch series of Bible story books. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. There's one called Good Little King Josiah. And we read about King Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. Of the high place, the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence. And the incense altars which were above them, he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, the molded images, broke in pieces, made dust of them, scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, as far as Naphtali and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wood images, had beaten the carved images into powder, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. What a start. What a wonderful thing that Josiah was doing. Verse 19. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law. They discovered the book of the law. It had been lost. It had been hidden for many years. And it was found. He, he read it. He heard what was there. And he tore his clothes. Verse 20. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, Shaphan, the scribe, Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me. And for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in his book. He was determined that they were going to obey God's word. And so he took steps. Verse 29. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, priests, the Levites, all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place, made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keep his commandments, his testimonies, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul. Same thing we promised at baptism. We told God we would serve him with all of our heart and all of our soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in his book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers, and Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. So what was the problem? Here was Josiah. We the, the same way. We were teachable, zealous. Even in little things, we wanted to learn everything we could. And hopefully we still do. We were careful. We became careful in how we lived. We, we overcame certain carelessness in things that we did. What about Josiah? He was not rebellious. He didn't have a reprobate attitude. He didn't deny God ever. But he became careless in a situation. And <coughs> stubborn in that same situation. Stubbornness, anything that any of us have ever faced. Stubborn is something that, you know, in a negative way that we know we need to overcome. I've labeled Josiah the stubborn king because what happened? Let's read in verse, uh, chapter 35, verse 20. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 35, verse 20. After this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, the king of Egypt, 
came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. Why? It was none of his business. But he sent messengers to him saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house for with, with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, refrain from meddling with God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Now, apparently God was involved in this somehow. Was it also a test for Josiah because God saw something he well, needed to be tested in? Whatever was going on, God was involved in this. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguise himself so that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo and the archers shot King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, take me away for I am severely wounded. The servants therefore took him out of the chariot, put him in the second chariot that he had and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. We believe the book of Lamentations as it contains those laments for Josiah. And to this day, all the singing men and the singing women uh, speak of Josiah and their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel. And indeed, they are written in the laments. Josiah just couldn't resist in this case meddling in something that was not his responsibility. He became stubborn about it. And I just labeled him the, the stubborn king, the hard-headed stubborn king. And unfortunately, it ended his life. And what about us? Here was a situation Josiah uh, couldn't change the situation, but he wouldn't stay out of it either. Is stubbornness in a negative way something that we need to overcome. There are, there are things to be stubborn about that are good to be stubborn about, God's way. But are there negative things that we know we're stubborn about that we need to change? <clears throat> Reading a story about a Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, the famous architect, has many structures all over the state of Wisconsin uh, that he built and he designed and built some very interesting structures even around the Milwaukee area. In 1937, he built a house for a businessman friend of his, a man named Hibbert Johnson. And one rainy evening, this businessman Johnson was entertaining some guests, some other businessmen and, and their wives, friends of his, when the roof began to leak in a house that Frank Lloyd Wright had designed and built for it. The roof began to leak. Well, the water seeped through the roof and it was directly above Johnson himself, dripping all straight onto his bald head. He was a bald man. And the water was dripping right on his head. And he was irate about this, grabbed his phone and called Frank Lloyd Wright, who was in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. And he said to him, Frank, you built this beautiful house for me and we enjoy it very much. But I have told you the roof leaks. And right now, I'm here with some friends and guests, and it is leaking right on top of my head. Wright's reply was heard by all the guests. Well, Hib, why don't you just move your chair? That's all I told him, move your chair. Hib was being so stubborn, he just sat there and let it drip on his head and complain about it instead of moving his chair. Well, again, you know, it's a, uh, he was a stubborn man, and apparently Josiah had some level of stubbornness that you know, he paid a severe penalty for. So I labeled him Josiah the Stubborn King. And the last one that I'll talk about is Solomon. How would you label Solomon? What would be your description of him? I think that the example of Solomon typifies a Christian, perhaps, that who has become enmeshed in the cares of the world, once again. Perhaps described here in Mark 4. Let's just read Mark chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> Mark 4, verse 18 and 19, the parable of the sowers and the sower and the seeds. Christ described it this way. 
some who are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful, becomes unfruitful. What do you remember about Solomon? In 1 Kings 3, do you remember when God offered to Solomon anything he would request? Do you recall what that request was? And how that it pleased God very much? 1 Kings 3, and beginning in verse 7. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant, Solomon, king instead of my father, David. But I am a little child. I do not, do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, and you have chosen a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, I give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord, the Solomon asked this thing. And so God gave him that and gave him so much more that he became renowned throughout the world at that time. But we know that that changed. And by the end of his life, we have a summary statement here in 1 Kings 11, verse 4. 1 Kings 11 and verse 4. Solomon lost that childlike attitude and zeal that he had. 1 Kings 11, verse 4, For it is it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Solomon let the things of the world, including his wives, come between him and God. My label for Solomon was Solomon the worldly king. Solomon the worldly king. For us, we can't afford to allow that to happen. Can't afford to allow the cares of this world to crowd out. We're all busy, but we can't afford to let prayer and Bible study and, and those spiritual tools be crowded out because we're busy. We all are busy and life gets busy, but it is a matter of priority. About taking time out for God in our lives every day and not allowing ourselves to drift away from that. So here are six examples of individuals who began zealous in obeying God, but each had a weakness that they didn't overcome, although God made a way of escape. God gave them ample opportunity to be warned, to turn around, to go in a different direction. But in each case, that weakness came between them and God because they didn't stop it when they should have. Let's conclude here in Ezekiel 18 because I think, again, it's a good reminder for us. Ezekiel 18. Notice the principle here, first in verse 24. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. But when a righteous man or a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. Think of all the righteousness some of these kings did for many decades because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them, he shall die. It's not only important in God's eyes how we begin in serving him, but that we maintain that relationship with him. Verse 21 and 22, But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, statutes does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. I think it's important for us to, to heed the warnings of the kings. There's a lot the kings of Judah can teach us. The examples that we've seen today, and with God's help, we know that help is available 
we can maintain that, that zeal for God, that faithfulness to God. We have His help with our relationship with God in prayer and study that is so important. We can maintain that. So let's continue to be the Christians of here in Ezekiel 18, verse 22. As it says, because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. 